Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Politics in the Pub. My name is Joe Nagy, and I will be chairing this meeting. Medicare, key plank for social justice, now under threat by the Abbott government. We are privileged tonight to have two expert speakers on the subject. Professor John Dwyer, Emeritus Professor of Medicine, University of New South Wales, and Dr. Con Costas, National President of the Doctors' Reform Society. Both these gentlemen uh, have been several times to this organization, to politics in the pub, so many of you here may know about them. Nevertheless, I'm going to just briefly mention a little bit of background on them, just in case some of you are not familiar with them. Professor Dwyer has championed the resurgence of clinician governance, and, and, and an interesting term if there ever was one. He is involved in efforts to create structural reform within the Australian healthcare delivery system. He has been heavily involved in the development of integrated primary care. This is a model that emphasizes prevention, early diagnosis, team management of chronic and complex diseases, and care in the community for many that are primarily sent to the hospital. He's a member of the New South Wales Department of Health's Health Care Advisory Council. He is also chairman of the Medical Staff Executive Council of New South Wales. Professor Dwyer founded the Australian Healthcare Reform Alliance, which sees 54 organizations now speaking with one voice on the need for reforms to the Australian healthcare system. For 11 years, he wrote a weekly newspaper column on health matters and has been a frequent public commentator on matters regarding health care. In 2005, he retired from his position as clinical dean and chairman of the Division of Medicine of Prince of Wales Hospital. His university honored him by granting him emeritus professor status. He remains active as a teacher, particularly in the HIV AIDS area, and lectures on health reform across Australia and internationally. John Dwyer will begin. John, please. Look, I think it's a very timely discussion tonight to look at what's happening with Medicare, because not to be concerned about the Abbott government's approach to health care and to the changes that they're planning to make uh, is to put Medicare at real risk, and I'll explain as I go along why I think that's the situation. Now, to put this in context for you, I need to just to make sure that you, you understand a bit about our healthcare system, its strengths and its weaknesses. In Australia, we're lucky that we have some very good things about our healthcare system. Miracles happen every day in our hospitals. And I suppose if at four o'clock this morning someone in the metropolitan area, unfortunately not necessarily the rural area, but if you have a heart attack at four o'clock in the morning, you may well find yourself in a well-equipped hospital with some expert putting a stent in your coronary artery, saving your heart from disaster. We handle tragedy, really serious illness, acute illness, pretty well in Australia. But our citizens are now increasingly burdened with a huge load of chronic and complex diseases, which although we all live longer than we did uh, a century ago, the average Australian was dead at 52 in 1900. The last 10 years of life for many people is for free of, um, of quality of life and is very, very expensive in terms of the care that they require. And this burden of chronic and complex disease is actually dominating the caregiving profile of Australian medicine. <clears throat> so if you look around the world at what's happening, and that's one of the real problems with healthcare is that neither the Labour Party when it was in office nor the, the current government really look outside our big island to see what is going on around the world, what other countries are trying to do to solve similar problems to the ones we have. Because our healthcare system, if you read the international literature, is regarded as very hospital-centric, very sickness-centric. We actually have more hospital beds per capita than any other OECD country. And as of tonight, because of our 
of inadequacies in our healthcare system, we need even more beds than we have available. You often, you often have seen in the newspaper about people waiting in emergency rooms for two or three days to get a bed, trolleys in emergency rooms being used as, as, uh, as beds. And we're very sickness focused in terms of our healthcare system, and we're very doctor centric. And our health professionals in Australia tend to work in silos. So you've got physiotherapists and allied health professionals and doctors and nurses. They're not working in a patient-focused way. And our healthcare system is generally regarded as one that is more suited to looking after the providers of healthcare than the patients that need healthcare. We don't have a patient-focused system. And we need to change that. We need to change that urgently, as many other countries are doing. The system that we need to move to, that other countries are moving to, is to get away from being sickness-centric to be health-centric, to put a major emphasis on prevention. And I'm going, that's going to be a major theme of what I say, talk to you about for the next few minutes. Prevention, we know so much about prevention, and most of the chronic and complex diseases that burden us, and of course so much suffering among individuals and cost us all as Australian taxpayers a lot of money, most of those chronic diseases are avoidable or at least minimizable if we address them early enough and looked at the lifestyle that people are leading. We are, we have, we are either first or second in terms of the rates of obesity in the world. America might just be pitting us out, but the rise of in obesity is just extraordinary in Australia. Among our children, we have very high rates of obesity, and we know that a fat four-year-old is going to be a fat 40-year-old. And we have not embraced the worldwide move to move to a wellness focus with the emphasis on preventing disease and preventing hospital admissions. Now, our Medicare system is something that is a treasure for us because at least in theory, and I, I, I'm the first to say it's in danger, but at least in theory it gives every Australian access to quality health care. But if you look at the original designs of Medicare and the equity that was supposed to be associated with it, what were the features that we, we as Australians were all proud of in, the, in thinking of ourselves as egalitarian society? That health care Quality health care would be available in a timely manner. Health care delayed is not acceptable because that can be disastrous and see disease progresses. It would be available in a timely manner. It would be a quality service and it would have a major emphasis on keeping us well and would be available to people on the basis of need, not their personal financial well-being. And increasingly in Australia, we've moved away from that. Australians pay more out-of-pocket expenses for their health than any other country except the United States. Last year, Australians had to spend $29 billion on top of their Medicare levy to pay for the, to pay for the extra things that they needed to help them stay healthy. And of course, there are many Australians who couldn't afford to pay anything and whose health suffered. And right up front for all of us, and for the, if only was true for the government, we have to recognise that our community, in so many areas, but particularly in health, is polarising between the haves and the have-nots. And we have gross inequity, gross inequity, in terms of health outcomes for Australians. So that, for example, if you live on Sydney's North Shore, you, on average, will live four to five years longer than if you live out in the western suburbs, outer western suburbs of Sydney. If you happen to live in a country town, even if you're white, you're going to die five or six years earlier on average than someone who lives in a wealthy suburb in the city. Epidemiologists talk about death by postcode in Australia because you can see the, that the poorer health outcomes are associated with poorer health services. Now, <clears throat> Medicare was supposed to stop all that, uh, that we were supposed to have equal access to quality services. But the, the truth of the matter is that unless we have some structural reform of Medicare uh, along the lines I'm about to talk to you about, uh, instead of that we're drifting further and further away from those, those goals. Now, 
it's, it's really obvious that the people who most need guidance from the healthcare, from healthcare professionals are the people most at risk of developing disease. <clears throat> and consequently, the government, when the government announced that it wanted to send a whole lot of signals to Australians about Medicare, one of them was that, listen, you guys, it's too expensive. We can't afford to spend as much money as we're spending on health. You're going to have to pay more. After all, says Peter Dutton, healthcare is not free. We've got to, you, you, Australians think it's free. Australians think it's free. We, our Medicare levy raises $9 billion a year of the $19 billion we spend on Medicare. And where does the other $10 billion come from? Consolidated revenue, our taxes. Every single penny that Medicare expends is paid for by us. Plus we have, because of the inefficiencies in the system, we have to pay all this extra money out of our pockets if we want to get uh, good health, and so many people cannot do that. But Mr. Dutton and the Abbott government said, we need to send a price signal. If you have to pay $7 co-payment, you'll, you'll appreciate the service better. And so, look, you know, $7 more if you see the doctor, if he gives you a prescription, another $7 more for that. If you need an x-ray, another $7 more for that. If you need a prescription, another $7 more for that. And <clears throat> that sort of imposition, $7, if I go to see my GP, frankly, $7 isn't going to make that much difference to me. But for millions of Australians, especially millions of young families, going to the doctor and having to pay an extra $20, 30 $40, it's going to make a huge difference. And we know that that is a deterrent to the people who most need to see their doctor and get help from actually going and getting it. And what frustrates me about this government is they don't realise that inequity is not only un Australian, please God it's un Australian, <laughs> but it's also very expensive. It's costing us a fortune because we've got so many sick people that we spend $19 billion on Medicare, but we spend every year in our public hospitals $140 billion looking after people in hospital. And would you believe that the Productivity Commission and studies at different universities over the years have shown us that 600,000 admissions to public hospitals, average cost $5,000, could be avoided if there had been a community intervention in the three weeks before someone ended up in an emergency room so sick that they had to go to hospital. And in America, <coughs> organizations that have specialized in changing their healthcare system to put the emphasis on continuity of care and, um, and, and care in the community, for $300, they can save a $5,000. Well, in America, it's more than $5,000. But for say in an Australian context, spending $300 on a, on a better community care program would save for $5,000 admission, let alone the suffering involved in going to hospital and the misadventures that occur in overcrowded hospitals. And we are not able to get the government to understand that the future of quality hospital care in Australia is not to build more beds. We can't find the nurses and doctors to look after them and they're hideously expensive. The future for quality healthcare is to reduce the number of patients that require hospitalisation. And that's where the emphasis is in just about every other OECD country. And there's an oodle of data, Mr Dutton, an oodle of data showing you that that re-emphasising, put that, swing the emphasis around, can save all these hospital admissions and achieve much better health outcomes for people. So. <clears throat> We're told that we can't afford Medicare and they're all going to have to pay a co-payment. The GP was told, first of all, that he would have to be the tax collector, he'd have to collect the $7, etc. Then he was told that he could keep the $7, but the average fee that GP would be paid for seeing you would be reduced by $7, about, so that you would only get now $31 uh, if you went, the GP would only get $31 for a standard consultation. Then, suddenly, Medicare wasn't all that expensive because a brainwave hit Canberra and they said, look, every penny that we raise from the $7 co-payments 
we're going to put it into a research fund. And we're going to build up the world's biggest research fund. Never mind that we've got people dying in inequity and we're not able to deliver the, the prevention and the care that, we, that people Australians need now, we will have the biggest $20 billion health research fund in the world. What happened to the business that we couldn't afford, the $19 billion? I mean, the illogicity of it, the flipping and flopping of it is just incredible. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it looks as though the co-payment will not get through the Senate. And that's a, that would be a good outcome, but of course it hasn't changed the hearts and minds of anybody in the government. And here is the basic problem that is a unique Australian problem that we've been talking about with you for 20 years. Peter Dutton, when he looks at the healthcare system, he looks at that box called Medicare, which he has to pay for, $19 billion. Instead of being the Minister for All Health in Australia, he looks at what Canberra has to pay for. The states have to pay for the hospitals and they get a contribution from the Commonwealth Government under this government massively reduced. You remember that the last Labor government of the COAG meeting, the Labor government said, all right, look, Canberra will have to give you more money to help you run your hospitals. We will pay 50% of any increase in hospital expenditure the states have to, have to fork out for this ever-growing demand for hospital care. Well, that's gone. That, that promise has disappeared. And when John Deeble and others negotiated the original Medicare agreement with the states, the plan was that the states would pay for 50% and the Commonwealth would pay for 50% of the hospital costs. When the dust settles in 2017, the Commonwealth will only be paying 30% of the costs of hospitalisation in Australia. <coughs> Where are, the, where are the states going to get the money? The $60 billion they're losing. I'm no economist, just a simple doctor, but many of my health economists tell me that this is a clear-cut signal that the Abbott government wants to raise the GST. He wants the states to be so bankrupt that they're going to have to say, listen, we have to raise the GST. Otherwise, how are we going to pay for these services? But the real problem is that in our system, uniquely, we divide responsibilities. For primary care is the responsibility of the Commonwealth Government. Hospital care is the responsibility of the states. And this wretched jurisdictional division has seen this argy-bargy back and forward, blaming, blaming cost-shifting and blaming a raise to an art form. Because Economics 101 should see Peter Dutton saying, hmm, if I spent five billion dollars more on Medicare, not making Australians pay even more for the same old, same old, but if I actually spent five billion dollars more and I improved the capacity to look after people in the community, we would save 30 billion dollars in terms of hospital costs. Mm -hmm. But of course, as Andrew Lamming, the doctor, a doctor who seems like a nice scholar, said at the meeting where I was making this point a year or so ago, he said, but that means the states would be the big benefits, beneficiaries from that if the Commonwealth did that. And it's this split in thinking, this no other OECD country is burdened with this divisional change. And until we have a single funder for the healthcare system, Commonwealth shouldn't run the healthcare system, but they should be the single funder of it. And then <clears throat> give that money to to run a patient-focused system <coughs> with a major emphasis on prevention. But as it is, the government only looks at the part that it's responsible for and says we can't sustain our Medicare expenditure. So what we're failing to do, is, and it's politically very lazy, is we are, the government is not prepared to take on structural reform. Structural reform is hard, it means you've got to change things, and it's easier, much easier, just to say, well, people have to pay more for the same old, same old. But we need the structural reform they're doing in New Zealand and in America and so many other countries in which we introduce a new model of primary care called integrated primary care. And this has been a model that has proved highly successful around the world. I'll just give you the, the we talk about it at the question time more detail, I'll just give you the nubbin of what it's all about. 
The model involves a system in which patients, individual citizens, are invited to enrol in a healthcare program. Enrolling is psychologically very important. You enrol in a program where you are cared, where you have access to a range of health professionals, not just a doctor. So instead of the GP maybe having a practice nurse and maybe if he's lucky having a physiotherapist come once a week or something, you have a team of health professionals. Nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, dental hygienists, all working in the one practice with the one record. And there is a, a psychological contract between patient and the professional team in which we say, we have a mutual obligation. You, patient, you will do everything you can to try and stay well and look after yourself and your family, and our contract is to give you all the help you need to do that. And we'll put a major emphasis on prevention, on picking up early signs that you might be, might be running a risk of developing a disease, of giving you within the one practice the team approach that you might need if you've got a series of complex problems, not referring you off to this specialist or the, over to see this physiotherapist over here and over here to find an occupational therapist. And we will, with that continuity, we will also have nurses that can go out and look at the fragile, our fragile customers in the community and keep an eye on them and when they, uh, they deteriorate a little bit, doctors and appropriate people can interact to stave all these unnecessary hospital admissions. Now if you look at, at programs like the Kaiser Permanente program in San Francisco and California, over 10 years they have reduced hospital admissions among the 8 million people they look after by 42%. They have an electronic health record that has just finished its 10th year of success and we're, it's still in the ether somewhere for us. I mean, we cannot get an electronic health record in Australia. So the structural reform we need is to spend more money on Medicare. If we actually needed more mo money for Medicare, if we had to put new money into it, then it would be perfectly reasonable to increase the Medicare levy. The fairest way of, of finding that money is to do it through a progressive tax system, not a regressive tax system. Sorry. And <clears throat> but if you look at the waste in the healthcare system the government won't tackle, just, if you've never thought of it before, think about the fact that we have nine departments of health for 23 million people. New York State's got 23 million people, they manage with one department of health. We are wasting $30 billion a year on these unnecessary hospital admissions. We have this private health insurance support system, rebate system, which is costing us over $5 billion a year, which if that money, which has not achieved its goal, remember when the government decided that it would subsidize our private health insurance, it said this was a move to take pressure off the public hospital system. It has done nothing of the sort. All it's done is seen more and more people using private hospitals for procedures that weren't available in the public hospital system anyway. And that money would have been much better spent in our public hospital system, which at the moment is finding it extremely difficult because of all the chronic medical problems to offer reliable elective surgery. And as a result of that, surgeons, many surgeons are charging an absolute fortune for their services, which many people just simply can't afford, because they've abandoned the public hospital system. They couldn't get time in the operating theater, so they just do it all in the private sector. So we have a lot of waste in the, in the system that we should be tackling first before we ask Australians to pay more. But even if we were to spend that $5 billion extra with new money, we'd be saving so much money by, and obtaining so much better health by reducing the amount of hospitalization and suffering that, that, goes, that goes with it. Now there's another crucial issue here that we all need to understand that I might, might pick up on, but I'm a medical educator. I've been teaching, I've been a doctor for 50 years, God help me. And all that, my whole career has been spent as an academic teaching medicine. And when I graduated in medicine, 60% of my class became general practitioners. Survey was published last week, showed that among 
young interns in hospitals today, only 13% have any interest in becoming a GP. And I have spent a lot of time in the last few years talking to general practitioners, looking at the problems, particularly in the country. I don't have time to talk to you about all that, but what is perfectly clear is that, we do, is that even if we wanted to move to this system, unless we do something about making the life of a GP more attractive, we're simply not going to have the doctors. We are so dependent on overseas trained doctors, especially in the country. 48% of the GPs in Western New South Wales are overseas trained doctors. Many of them are terrific. They're there though because they have to be there. That's the only place they're allowed to work. And people in the country deserve to be looked after by people who want to look after them, who, who have real knowledge of the differences but in the pathology that you face in the country, if I took a G good GP from Bondi tomorrow and put them in Narrabri, they'd be like a fish out of water for a long time because the things that they're seeing and the problems of the people on the land are quite different from what they're dealing with in Bondi. Young GPs hear horror stories about turnstile medicine practiced by GPs who get $31 and $36 an occasion of service who have to see 10 people an hour to pay the overhead. So a consultation time of 15 minutes is a luxury. When we teach medical students, the irony is that if they were to do what we, what we professors teach them to do, they couldn't possibly do it in 15 minutes. 45 would be closer to the truth. So doctors can't listen between the lines anymore and they're unsatisfied with the care they're giving and their patients are unsatisfied. We have Australians drifting off into unscientific hands if you look at the amount of pseudoscience is out there in the community and people are going to iridologists and naturopaths and reflexologists and, and things. And many patients will say to a doctor, well, at least I get an hour of someone's attention if I, if I do that. So we need a new model of care that attracts young doctors into primary care and around the world this integrated primary care model is the one that has captured the imagination. In New Zealand, 85% of the GPs have moved away from fee-for-service and are happy to accept a contract or a salary for the majority of what they do. In America, 60% of the GPs have moved away from fee-for-service. So in summary, we have quite a shocking lack of vision in Canberra in terms of the healthcare system Australia needs. We have no will, we see no will for structural reform, for the major reforms. We see no sign of intellectual engagement with the rest of the world in terms of what, what they're doing to improve healthcare systems. We have no sign that there be any rationalization of this funding mess that we have between the states and the federal government. We remain with a very hospital-centric system and we're all missing out on a system which would provide fairer, better health and be cost effective and sustainable. People say, you know, we can't afford all this. We could easily afford it, a wealthy country like us. We could easily afford all the health care that we need in giving people modern advantages if we reformed and structurally reformed the system and put this, this emphasis on prevention. But prevention is a very positive concept. It just doesn't happen. You need an infrastructure to work with people to provide them with prevention. If you look at the World Health Organization's report card on Australia, they say we're particularly bad in three areas. I mean, one, good start programs. We do not give mothers, especially young mothers, a, a good enough help to start for the first four years of life of their first child. And we're paying the penalty for that with the number of children that are in trouble. We do not, we do not have a mechanism for following the mental health growth of adolescents. And we know that if we can pick up mental health aberrations in a teenager, we can often prevent psychotic and really nasty psychiatric things developing. And our oral health record for a wealth, wealthy country is just simply disgraceful. So there's, there's so much to be done. There's so much that could be done. It can be afforded. If we need a reform journey, but we can't have that without having the political, convincing our politicians to show the leadership to take us on this reform journey. And what I'm saying to you tonight is not controversial. I, I go to many meetings about healthcare reform, and all the professionals all saying the same thing, that government is not listening. I look forward to listening to you a little later on. I'm looking forward to hearing what Tom's got to say. Thank you very much for listening.